of Forum E-Commerce Brazil. I thank you very much for letting me be among you. I thank you very much for, letting, for sharing some of your thoughts with me. I look forward to more fantastic content, the stuff we've already heard, and more stuff you'll hear later this afternoon. I look forward to meeting and hearing all of your great thoughts and all of us working together to help to solve some problems. Our conversation today is going to be about e-commerce, which is not a surprise. But the most important part of the conversation we're going to have today is not just about the technology of e-commerce. We're going to talk about the behavior patterns of consumers. And we're going to talk about the fact that consumers no longer respect the boundaries of traditional retail. They no longer respect the boundaries of time and place that retailers have put on consumers. They no longer necessarily respect the boundaries that brands put on consumers relating to categories. Because for a consumer, it's just shopping. So we're going to do this, we're going to drill down into three um, modules. First, we're going to talk about living in a post-channel world. We'll discuss newly familiar behaviors that come from familiar behaviors. We'll talk about vanity metrics and clarity metrics. And there are some numbers today some metrics that just don't matter anymore, and we'll go into that. We're going to talk about how then each of us should be taking the insights that come off of the use of mobile devices today and turn that into action. Second module, we're going to talk about consumer loyalty, and we're going to focus on delivery. And delivery does not just mean supply chain. We'll talk about that. I want to urge you to redefine your understanding of category. I want you to think differently about what category means for you, for your brands, and for your consumers. We're going to talk about search. We know for a fact that a consumer will abandon a, will abandon a shopping trip if she can't find what she thinks she's looking for. So we talk about how we can fix that. Then, after we've created all of these fantastic ideas, We'll talk about actually getting it done. How do you determine the value of doing this to your business? And then finally, we'll talk about how you have to manage change to get it all done. But first, we're going to talk about channel conflict, where it started. We're going to talk about how mobile has become such an important part of the behavior patterns of people's lives, even outside of shopping. So we turn to shopping. And back in the old days, and I mean the old, old days, retail used to be so easy. There were consumers and there were retailers, and everybody had a job. The retailer was there to stay in stock and be convenient for the consumer to shop. Brands from companies such as mine, and probably many of yours out there as well, our job was to make products and to keep the retailers in stock and to do some mild promotion. But for the most part, the retailer maintained the relationship with the consumer. And then e-commerce became something that people actually did. But it, too, was pretty easy. Your computer used to be tethered to the wall because there was not mobile. And so when you were doing e-commerce, you were sitting in front of the computer, facing the screen, focused on your task, and you were buying things from places like Amazon that sold in specialized ways, or you were buying things that you could afford to wait a week to receive. So it was a very, very separate event from regular retail. And as a result, in the United States, and I'm pretty sure everywhere else in the world as well, retailers, as they launched their dot-coms, as they launched their online stores, they kept the two businesses separate because they did not want the relatively poor performance of e-commerce to drag down the main performance of the main retail business. Make sense so far? Understood? Then mobile ruined everything. 2007, Apple created the iPhone. The iPhone was not the first multifunction portable device, but it was the first that was the first device that made the internet available to each of us pretty much wherever in the world we were. It was the first one with a credible web browser, and it gave us the ability to do things with our lives that we were never able to do online outside of the home before. And adoption of smartphones became very, very prevalent. These numbers here are just in the US. This is the penetration of smartphones of the entire mobile phone market. You can see, you know, ending in December 2016, 81% of mobile phones were smartphones. So you can see how people went from using a device that enabled them to make phone calls to a computer that's in their hand. And it happens very, very quickly. You've probably seen a chart like this. 
This shows you what happens every minute on the internet. But here's what's important about this. Take a look at the chart. You don't see Apple's logo. You don't see um, LG. You don't see Samsung. We're not talking about the device. We're not talking about the technology. We're talking about the behavior pattern. This is what people are doing on the internet every 60 seconds. And take a look at the items that are mobile only. You see, so you have this much activity happen that's limited to mobile. And so what this is telling us is that people have adopted mobile not as something cool that they can show to their friends as the Apple iPhone was when it first came out, but as an essential tool that they use in their lives. And as much as we talk about the borderless internet and how you can be anywhere, anytime on the internet, there's nothing in here about China. So mobile also creates relatively localized behavior. This is just the U.S. Okay, so you can see how important this is as a driver of behavior, not just a technology. So mobile has been brought four particular um, behavior patterns I want to call to your attention. First of all, it has given us access to everything on the internet. No matter where you are, you can get pretty much whatever you want to. It has introduced the notion of apps, and apps are important because apps give you extended features from the device. So you're doing much more than sitting in front of a laptop just using your phone. You're actually able to do things that you can't do on a laptop. It has introduced brand new interface options, the poke, the press, the swipe, the pinch. Now, that may seem to you to be what happens when two 15-year-olds are making out. But in fact, this is what you're doing with the phone. And the idea is that you don't have to type anymore. You can enter information just with your thumb. And finally, it enables people to become content creators. Anybody can create content and put it up on the internet because of their phone. You can take a picture of the meal that a waiter has put down in front of you. You can take a picture of something you've bought and you've taken out of the box. You can take a picture of your kid feeding the neighbor's cat. That's gross. Don't let your kid feed the neighbor's cat. So where are we now? We are definitely living in what I consider to be a post-channel world. And one of the things I'd like you to take away from this conversation we're having today is the notion that mobile is not a technology, it's a behavior pattern. The human beings are consumers. We consume more than just things. We consume relationships. We consume information. We transact all of that information, all of those relationships, hard goods that we buy, conver conversations that we have. You know, I was using WhatsApp with a friend of mine who lives in Saudi Arabia in the back there. I actually have never met this guy. I know him through a friend of a friend, but we have a pretty close relationship. He sent me a picture of his guitar. Mobile has been a prime driver of consumer behavioral change because this, it means that you're no longer bound to the confines of a store. Um, and shopping is not actually the only beneficiary of this change. So there's three specific behaviors I want to share with you. We use mobile to keep from getting lost. So I've come to Sao Paulo for the very first time today, and I will definitely be back. I love this city. We can monitor how politicians use Twitter. Sometimes not so good, but sometimes it works out really, really well. And it also enables us to solve fights that we may get into at the dinner table. Do we think it's Massa? You think it's Rubens? No, right? Exactly, okay, thank you. See, we can all agree. <laughs> so this new post-channel retail world is very, very clear to consumers, but not to brands or retailers. And this is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. You will hear the word disruption many, many times over the course of this, con of this conference. You'll hear disruption in the presentations that you receive from a capability provider. You'll hear disruption from guys like me, Scott, who was up here earlier from Neiman Marcus. Consumers are not being disrupted by anything. They're not being disrupted. They're going on with their day. They're taking care of their business. They're doing what they want to do. It's the brands and the retailers that are being disrupted. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind because it means that brands and retailers probably should think about adapting their behaviors a little bit. Brands and retailers have a very competitive relationship for the consumer's love. Historically, when the retailer owned the relationship and the brand stayed back and did some advertising, everybody was getting along just fine. But now in the age of mobile, 
Consumers demand more from brands, and they demand more from retailers. And alone, neither the brand nor the retailer can do it. So the relationship really needs to change from something competitive like this to something more like this, where we're respecting our power, we're respecting our capabilities, we're respecting the role that we each play in the lives of the consumer. Because if we don't get that done, the consumer will go off and find somebody who can. So, given all this, what should the courageous omni-channel retailer do? The first thing they need to do is really eliminate the silos between in-store and e-commerce. It's just shopping. It's one shopping event. You can't have them held out separately because then the retailer is going to underfund and under-resource e-commerce because those numbers are necessarily lower. You need to combine all these channels, and you focus on attribution models so you know what consumers were, were doing that made them complete a sale or not. And then you need to share, share non-consumer level data with brands. And this is something that maybe not everybody will like to hear. Brands don't need consumer level data. Sure, it'd be great if we had it, but we don't need it. So, the retailer can still retain that relationship. That's fine. The brand can be massively helpful without it. So, for the brand side, what should we be doing? We need to start building a solid digital shelf infrastructure so we understand what's actually happening out in the world across all the retailers that we serve. We need to think about su changing supply chain so we can support eaches. A company like mine does very, very well supporting large retailers. We need to learn how to become equally adept at supporting individual consumers by getting a box with one item onto their doorstep. We need to think about category in a broader sense as well. So one of the things we're going to talk about here is that, and that applies to brands as well. And then we also need to share our insights about how consumers use our brands in their lives with retailers so we can fine-tune the consumer experience. Making sense so far? Understood? We're going to go into our first module then. And it's all about living in a post-channel world. And I want to introduce you to the notion of familiar and newly familiar behaviors. Texting is a very familiar behavior. But in Brazil, texting was 55 times more expensive than it was in the USA. Then WhatsApp entered, and WhatsApp was able to deliver the experience of messaging for free. And now it has a 96% adaption and adoption and use rate among Brazilians. Do most apps have a 96% adoption rate? No. The reason why WhatsApp has such a high adoption rate is because it took a familiar behavior and it adapted it to a, new, to a newly familiar behavior. And I think this quote uh, from Fernando Saboya says it all. It's a one-stop solution for everyone and enables you to manage everything from transactions to relationships. Now, you here in the audience in Sao Paulo, you probably know this. Intrinsically, you understand this. But what you may not be acutely aware of is that this is, the this is what happens when a familiar behavior becomes a newly familiar behavior. If you were to ask somebody to take their phone out, s open up a special app that scans something that then takes you somewhere else to show you content, that sounds like a lot of work. But if you are using a messaging app for something that you compulsively do anyway, that's a, pretty familiar, that's a pretty familiar behavior, and it's something that people will adapt. So let's take a quick trip over to China. There's 900 million WeChat users, and uh, 200 million of them have payment cards linked to their WeChat accounts. The idea that WeChat is able to take the fundamentals of what people are doing anyway, texting, and add the ability to share payments with friends as well as with companies and governments is pretty powerful. It says a couple of things about the platform. First of all, the platform is trustworthy. Second of all, it is something that people are comfortable doing because they do it already. I'm already sharing my thoughts. I'm sharing some of what I like in my life with my friends through this. I want to be able to pay them $20, you know, $20 for a ticket that they purchased on my behalf. And if I'm paying a friend and I trust that this is secure, I should be able to pay a company as well. And then you have a whole new payment system. And the beautiful thing about WeChat is, and other platforms like WeChat, they provide a feedback loop. So you give the capability to a consumer, the consumer uses the capability, 
you monitor how the consumer uses the capability, and then you expand the capability to give them more of what they like. They do it more, they give you more information, and you expand it again. And you create this feedback loop, and it makes those companies that have that very, very powerful. And so people realize, this is something new, but it fits into my life. And it's as safe as it is easy. So if you have this feedback loop of activity that is telling you how you should go about your maintaining your interaction with a consumer, you gotta wait for me there. We start to talk about how we're gonna monitor it. And we're gonna talk about vanity metrics and clarity metrics. So vanity metrics approximates the consumer experience, but clarity metrics delivers the journey. Vanity metrics provides a, a view of what happened. So vanity metrics are kind of like uh, hits on a website or likes. But vanity metrics don't tell you what the consumer did to get them to a point where you wanted them to do something and then if they did it or if they didn't do it, why? And in this day and age, vanity metrics are not as useful as they used to be. For two decades, marketers like myself have used these kinds of metrics and we carefully create this story to share with management of why something, why we should do something. When in fact, it doesn't really tell us much of anything. It just says, so what? But clarity metrics give us the opportunity to really track what a user likes to do. And if we give them more of that to do, can we have them convert and do something that we actually want them to do as well. So it includes attribution, it includes what happens after they converted or didn't convert, and then it enables us to gauge when a return consumer behaves a certain way, what can we do to help them do that more often. It's a very, very important part of turning insights into action once you have those metrics. This is a pretty nifty little uh, visual. This shows New York City, and this shows check-ins from Foursquare over the course of a day. And as you, as you look at it, you can see the lines where people are coming in from. You can see the explosion of colors where they're checking into, which parts of the city are the most active. And then you see the colors change, and the colors change correspond to the time of day, which means in the morning, people are checking into work, and then as work ends, they're checking into a bar, and then they're checking into dinner before they go home. You, you want that to be that way. You don't want it to be where they come in in the morning, they check into a bar. That's what you don't want. But this gives you a lot of information about how people are behaving in their daily lives. Your management may say, so what? Because they know that the amount of time spent on mobile vastly outstrips the amount of time spent on desktop, but people convert more on desktop than on mobile. So why do I care about people checking in when I know that they have to convert more readily in front of a laptop? And the answer is that you're monitoring their behavior. The answer is you're, you're working to learn what they like to do so you can give them experiences that will help them convert wherever they are. And so there's a tremendous amount of value in that data stream, a tremendous amount of value in that observation to, sh to show you here's what people are naturally doing without me necessarily asking for it. And so the big so what is to say you want to seek out insights that tell us how people are thinking. And then you want to be able to position yourself to get the right kind of mobile engagement. You want to think about some advanced digital shelf monitoring so you can see what's really happening out there. It's like a periscope into a different environment. And you want to start pursuing lifetime value a little bit differently. And we're going to go into each of these very quickly. This is a chart that came out from a brand new Comscore um, report earlier this year, um, the mobile's hierarchy of needs. It's based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I highly recommend that you go and you get this because it's a great piece of work in my opinion. You can see that there are these different levels according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and then there are the types of businesses that sort of align with those levels next to it. And I saw this and my first thought was, well, there's a problem because my company sells diapers, for instance. So necessarily, we would fit into the physiological level, right? Health, apparel. But in fact, it's a mother and a baby, or a father and a baby. And there's a lot of love and care and nurturing in there, which means it might be closer to safety or love and belonging. 
And if you think about how a consumer behaves, and if you think about the, the way that he or she goes through their lives, they're traversing all of these levels every day, sometimes simultaneously. So as a brand, how are you presenting yourself to align with these levels? Because it's not just one message. It's a message of love and belonging, or it could be a message of safety, or it could be a physiological message, depending upon the consumer. So it gets to the heart of the need for personalization, because the consumer's already traversing all of these levels on their own. And how effective are we as a brand, or frankly, even as a retailer, at traversing these levels as well? Does that make sense? You understand what we're talking about? Because now we're going to take a hard left turn and start talking about some technology a little bit. We're talking about advanced digital shelf monitoring. Most everybody here probably engages in some digital shelf monitoring, but I want to focus on the columns. The column at the far left rolls shows the people within an organization who should be using this. And you'll notice most of these rolls aren't even necessarily digital rolls. The objectives and the KPIs in the middle are where we are deriving our, our clarity metrics and turning it into what we want to actually achieve. And then the metrics over on the right are also showing us a lot of information about what's happening that's not even necessarily digital. So if you're engaged in digital shelf monitoring, you may have half dozen people in your organization actually using the tool. It should be used by almost everybody. And then I want to talk about pursuing consumer lifetime value. We all know that CLTV is it's pretty pretty fancy math. And it's the math that basically lets you know why there are 812 McDonald's in Brazil, and not more and not less. But before you can compute lifetime value, you kind of have to earn lifetime value. You have to earn the respect and the loyalty of the consumer. And so what I want to talk to you about are four ways that you should think about how you're transacting your business in this mobile world, in this post-channel era, to achieve that. I want to talk about transactional emails, dynamic ad creative. I want to talk about the unsung hero of the smartphone, which is the digital wallet, and then some shoppable experiences. I want to introduce you to a brand new thing um, that uh, Amazon just released in the US. Uh, I think it was last week, even. So <clears throat> transactional emails. When you have somebody purchase something from you, the emails that follow that purchase, telling them, thank you for your purchase, hey, we've shipped it, hey, here's the tracking number. Those are transactional emails. Those are effectively a way for you to continue a relationship with a consumer. You should be, with these emails, keeping your consumer going. The consumer's already given you money, the consumer's already given you trust. The least you could do is reward that by using these emails to show how much more value you're going to add to the relationship. Dynamic ad creative. You know, in this age of personalization, in this age of mobile, in this age of the information that is coming off of our activities, if you're advertising, the least you could do is semi-personalize the advertising. So at Kimberly Clark, we did a program in Canada where we ran ads uh, where we used some machine learning and we read the information off of the web browser or the device of the consumer. And then when they came around to our place where we were running media, we ran a customized ad. So one ad series for our diapers brand, Huggies, created 1,200 different variations. But the key is this, our return on ad spend went down over the course of the program by 24%. Well, what this is telling us is the machine learning was able to draw better clicks for less money because it was taking ad, ad combinations that were not working and getting rid of them and running ad combinations that were working. So the personalization in advertising works and it's there. Owning the digital wallet. Who here uses their digital wallet on their phones? Yep. And if your hand isn't raised, you're lying. Everybody does. But these are great because, you know, an app requires that you run updates through the App Store. It's a software release. It takes weeks to finish. But a digital wallet can take content and data updates without having to be run through the App Store. This is my IHG Rewards Club card in my wallet. Look at that space. There's nothing there. Shouldn't you give me some kind of a scannable code that I could use at checkout or online? Because you know who I am. I've signed up for the program. Or should you be giving me a message that says, share this with a friend, and I'll give you both an incentive? And then when I do that, you can change that incentive to be something else because you know that I did it. 
and nobody's using this. So this is something else you really should think about in terms of how you're interacting with your consumer on a regular basis. Now I want to talk to you about Amazon Spark. Amazon Spark is very similar to Instagram, except it is a fully vertically integrated shopping experience. So as, you, so as a Prime, Amazon Prime member in the US, using iOS only, you can identify shoppable items inside of a picture, click on it, and it takes you to the Amazon page where the item is for sale. This is not anything new. Instagram's already doing this, Pinterest is trying to do this, but the key that Amazon has is that they have eliminated a lot of the friction. Amazon knows people like to share, Amazon knows people like to shop, and Amazon knows that people like Amazon. So they've set something up to make it just so simple for me to share with my friends what I have in my life, and if my friends like it, they can buy it as well. So I want to talk very, very quickly about capturing consumer loyalty. Um, we talk about delivery, and I want you to think differently about delivery. Yes, it includes supply chain, but it also includes your one-to-one -one interactions with consumers, and it also means you're delivering a seamless experience between online and offline. It's how are you delivering? How are you giving back to the consumer what you want them to have? And to get there, I want you to take the teenager's bedroom challenge. This looks like a disaster area for most of us. And if you go into a store, a big, uh, a big retail store, the items in this picture probably span five or six different aisles, five or six different parts of the store. But for the teenager, this is one single aisle called me. Everything here makes sense to the teenager. And so the idea is that categories are really about individual consumers, not about shelving adjacencies. When people who are infinitely more organized than a teenager are having a baby, here are the things that our research shows us that they buy. We only sell the top two, but look at SLR camera and coconut water, both on that list. Go into a baby store. You will never find an SLR camera or coconut water in the baby aisle, but it should be in the baby aisle because that's how consumers are shopping it. And so you can use the digital realm to create an aisle that actually aligns with what consumers are looking for. We don't know what's in those boxes that she's opening. We don't know if she bought them together for a reason or if she bought them together randomly, but we know that she bought them together. And we, know, we don't need to know why. We just, need, we just know that we have an opportunity to maybe try to merchandise things differently for her because this is how she behaves as a shopper. We know that search is king. Search is the most important part of the consumer experience right now. But we also know that search hasn't changed in a long time. Remember this? Vintage 1997. So this is search today. Now, this is from a major retailer in the US. I've removed the, I've removed the logo and changed it to logo, so you can't see who it really is. But this is about how most search works for most major, for most major um, um, department stores in the world, frankly. It's tabular, it has a lot of filtering over on one side, it's sorted by relevance and nobody knows what relevance means. I'm looking for diapers, what's relevance about that? And as though I don't have enough to enter as far as keywords goes, it's given me an option to add more keywords. And the mobile version isn't any better. It's the same, it's tabular, it's sorted by relevance, and it's a thumb workout. So, what I'm about to show you is among, you're going to be among the very, very first people to see this. And I will warn you, it's ugly. I did not go to a graphic designer to make this look nice because I want you, my peers in the industry, to see this in the, raw, in, in the raw form. But this is an idea of what I think search should be like. If you look at that big Venn diagram in the middle, if you're searching for diapers, diapers could fall under three categories, active baby, sort of an eco-friendly line, and a dry fit line, for instance. Instead of giving somebody a hierarchy based on what you think they should look at, where you're automatically imposing a value, put it in the Venn diagram. The Venn diagram shows you that some of these fall way more into one category than the others, some of them straddle a couple, but the bottom line is you're not telling the consumer Here's what I think you want. You're saying, there's a lot of potential right answers here. What, what else should there be? And by the way, we'll add some category information so you can help to understand why am I looking at this. And then we uh, will give you a cross-sell option. If you're in this category, you probably want to consider these things as well. And then when a consumer hovers over one of the options or taps one of the options on their phone, 
we can give them a buy box. And at that point, you can give them a subscription option if there is one, if there's a coupon option, or anything. Now, again, this is really ugly, but I hope that there's some thinking here that you find a little bit compelling, and it helps you think about search a little bit more aggressively. So, getting this done, and I'm going to race through this because um, we're running low on time and there's so much to talk about. E-commerce is a lousy business model, and so it's really hard to get funding for brand new e-commerce initiatives because it's very hard to show an ROI. But the way to do it is to take your current market share and compute your fair share. And that difference is the amount of money that you have to potentially win. And once you can show that to management, you'll be able to get a lot more um, interest in what you're talking about. So, you have an item. You're at a 35% market share that's worth 100 million something. But when you do your fair share analysis, how much of the market you should have, you should be at 42%, which is up to 120, because remember, you're adding 20% on top of 35%, right? So, you have, so your total is $120 million, right? So wouldn't your management be happy to give you $2 million if you thought you could actually get $20 million out of it? And my guess is, yeah, your management would go ahead and approve that. They would also be wondering why you're looking at Snoop Dogg. So how are we spending our $2 million? Actually, which is 6.285 million real. Um, there's three things you need to make this work. You need, to, you need to have leadership that knows how to actually get this done. The company has to be behind it. You need money and people. Okay, the four things that you need to make this work. Leadership that knows how to do this. The company needs to be behind it. Money and people. And I'll go through this quickly. You know, the, the, the leadership that knows how to do this is basically somebody that can traverse all of the different parts of the company effectively, and somebody who understands marketing and technology as well, and can explain it, because you're in a marketing technology combination right there. We talk about company culture and the culture of change. It really has to come from the top. This is a long-term commitment to change. It can't be quarter by quarter. You're fundamentally changing the company, and you have to, because the consumer has already changed. The budgets that you need are going to have to be reallocated from other parts of the company. And nobody likes this, but here's how you have to explain it and work through it. The entire company is being impacted by this. The entire company. So the entire company has a stake in this getting done right. So the entire company should contribute to that solution, otherwise they'll become a passenger on the train instead of the driver. And if these other departments are able to, and when money is reallocated from other departments to this initiative, they have the right to put people on that team as subject matter experts. And so everybody has a stake in the game. And finally, the people that you need. And again, you need some outside talent to make it fresh. You can blend it with some inside talent. But the people that drive this initiative are the most important ones. And I think this Richard Rumelt quote is really good. Good strategy and good organization lie in specializing on the right kinds of activities and imposing only the essential amount of coordination. Get the right people in the room and you can get it going. Whenever we talk about this, we talk about very important technology platform decisions. Do you want to build or you want to buy? And when IT gets involved, it gets expensive. But I think most people here will be happy to know that my approach is to rent and partner. And Scott mentioned it in his first presentation of the day as well. You want to be able to identify these gaps that you want to fill. And then you want to find the capabilities out in the marketplace that can fill them for you. Don't try to do it yourself. There's a lot of very, very smart capability providers in this room. There's a lot of people out there that are showing you what they can do, and they're good. Don't try to outthink them. Work with them and partner. And by partner, it means you figure out who's paying for what, because there is going to be a cost involved. And sometimes you can share the cost across a couple of different stakeholders. Finally, I want to give you three rules that will ensure success. And by success, I mean how are we better able to work with today's mobile consumer and engage with them and be a part of their daily lives. And then finally, I want to give you three questions you need to ask yourself that will then help you to bring this message to people in your organization. You have to align with people's behavior patterns. People have, 33% more people have access to mobile phones and to toilets you need to go ahead and move in a direction that consumers are already moving. So just because you have a really good idea for something that nobody's doing, don't do it. It's not going to work. That sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how much money is wasted on a perfectly good idea that nobody cares about. 
you have to deliver a clear value proposition. Everything for the consumer is about the same number of clicks away. So as a brand, as a retailer, you need to figure out what is your unique niche. Because in as much as consumers have a world of change and a world of options in front of them, as a brand and a retailer, you have a world of consumers. You are not beholden to serve just those consumers that are convenient for you. You can serve anybody. So even though your territory may be just in the United States, you can sell everywhere else in the world because anybody should be able to get to you. So, you want to build experiences that put the consumer at the center. And they can be had in a place where that you don't even necessarily need to be in control. And the third is you want to be a trusted source. It's very, very tempting to go it alone. We've been talking about WeChat, we've been talking about WhatsApp, but the fact of the matter is the first platform that got to a billion users is Facebook. And Facebook through Messenger is also in the messaging and commerce game. The idea is that you may want to go it alone, you may feel like you can build it yourself, but give some thought to aligning with one of the major platforms. Because if you align with a major platform, you inherit the trust of all of its users. And there's a bunch of big platforms out there. So, some questions you should ask yourself. What defines a digitally influenced shopping trip? Your spouse calls you at work and says, bring home eggs. Is that a digitally influenced shopping trip? She sends you a text and says, bring home eggs. Could be, right? Two, what defines an in-store sale versus an e-commerce sale? So in the US, you think about click and collect as a model. In the US, Starbucks through the app enables you to order your drink ahead of time, and then you go to the store and it's ready for you. So the store is making the product that you're picking up, but you ordered it on your phone outside of the store. Is that an e-commerce sale or is that an in-store sale? Three, you're driving along and you're on a bot and you're trying to get some information about a product. By the way, don't drive and text. Okay, but you're driving and you're texting with a bot and you decide, okay, I'm gonna buy this product, so you run into the store to pick it up. Is that an in-store purchase or should the e-commerce team get the win? And the answer to all of those questions is yes. Because every path to purchase starts with a smartphone. But where it ends is up to you. Thank you very much.